Hello. Welcome back to the Space School Logo, the Western PPSW, your favorite hangout place. Today we're back with a brand new Star Wars story. Today we'll discover what would have happened had Mace Windu survived his fall from the Senate building. How could Mace influence the outcome of the galaxy or the Jedi? Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else a part of the Penty Patrol team. If you want a chance to win in our next giveaway, watch to the end of the video, and I'll tell you all about how you can win. Our story begins in the Senate chambers. Mace Windu is gridlocked in a battle for his life. His main squad had just been killed off by the Sith Lord. Sacy Tin, Agon Kolar, and Kit Fisto lay dead in the far room as two blades moved back and forth. Amethyst and Crimson decided their fate as the most incredible duelists in centuries met on this battlefield for the fate of the galaxy. Each side had their reasons to win and their reasons to ensure the other duelists died a miserable defeat at the hands of the other. Mace Windu was trying to end the legacy of the Sith for good. It had been evident for the last 13 years that they were still around, ever since Kenobi beat Maul on Naboo. But Mace, as the Master of the Order, was going to put an end to it here and now. Regardless of what the Jedi Code said, he was going to ensure the downfall of the legacy of the Sith. Sidious, on the other hand, had spent his entire life waiting for this moment. He created a galactic scale war so that he could ensure the downfall of the Jedi Order. Here and now, he was able to set in stone the puzzle pieces to begin the downfall by killing off the fourth council member on this planet. Mace Windu was a fearsome opponent. Both duelists knew what was on the line, and Sidious knew more than Mace that if he won it, it would be the end of the Jedi. Sidious set up this war so that he could use the Jedi's own army against them. sifo set the pillars in stone, and now Sidious was going to ignite the flame that would rupture an order that had been established for millennia. Sidious and Mace paused momentarily as their gazes met one another. The duelists lifted their blades slowly and elegantly as they collided yet again, and another slow gaze before the speed picked up. Each duelist was testing the waters with one another as they faced down each other. Mace pushed his aggressive position as Sidious leaped off the furniture scattered throughout the room. As the two collided their blades with one another in the middle of the room and closed into combat. Both Mace and Sidious could feel that Anakin was close. He must have just landed at the landing pads. Sidious knew that he had to get the strength to show in this moment. He needed to prove to Anakin that the Sith were more powerful than the Jedi. If he could kill Mace before Anakin arrived, it would be the perfect fuel for him to turn against the Order. Sidious was so enthralled with his idea, he didn't realize who he was facing. The Master of the Order harnessed the dark presence from Sidious as he used it against his opponent. Sidious was completely caught off guard as he tumbled back. He looked into Mace's eyes and watched as a sinister Jedi Master cut through the glass in the Senate office. Sidious saw the opportunity to strike, and when he swung, he was thrown off balance as Mace pushed him back. Sidious's lightsaber flew through the window and into the city below. Mace then shoved Sidious back as he pointed his blade forward. Palpatine couldn't believe this. He lost fair and square to a Jedi Master. He never would have anticipated this ever happening in a million years. Palpatine pushed himself back as Mace followed closely with his lightsaber pushed forward. He was going to extinguish the Sith for eternity, and as he got close to landing the final blow on Sidious, he saw Anakin from the corner of his eyes. Mace couldn't believe it. He told him to stay in the Council Chambers. He was extremely disappointed. Even though he could feel the presence of Anakin arriving, he was disappointed to see the sight. Mace was going to give Anakin the rank of Master once he returned, and he just needed to know that he could trust Anakin. And because Anakin was telling the truth, Mace had his trust installed in Anakin. Now, after everything, he was just going to break that trust. Mace held up his hand. He was going to deal with this later, as he turned his attention back towards Sidious and spoke up, telling the Sith Lord that the oppression of the Sith was at an end. Anakin listened as Palpatine told Anakin that he was right. The Jedi were trying to take him over. Sidious knew that he needed to play his cards just right. He just showed that the Sith could be beaten by a Jedi, and now he needed to find the right way to convince Anakin that he should join the Sith. Sidious had waited too long just to have Anakin side with Mace Windu here and now. Sidious would play the victim, playing helpless, as he could to perceive himself, and as the worlds between Mace and Sidious continued, the Sith Lord shot lightning at Mace. The Jedi Master was able to deflect the lightning back at Sidious. The Sith spoke up, telling Anakin he had the power to save the ones he loved. Mace knew that the Sith was trying to do, and he told the Chosen One not to listen to Sidious. He couldn't listen to Sidious. The Dark Lord was trying to deceive him of a lie. And there was no reason to believe such a lie. That lie would ruin everything Anakin had going for him. 
Anakin then watched as Sidious faded back, telling Mace he couldn't hold it any longer. Anakin stood as he told Mace that Sidious would have to stand trial. Mace had the look of revenge, carelessness, and power in his eyes. Anakin pleaded with him. The lightning had stopped, telling him that this wasn't the Jedi way. The Master Jedi lifted his lightsaber into the air. Anakin tried one last time to tell Mace that he needed Palpatine before Anakin cried out in a loud no and cut off Mace's forearm. Sidious saw the opportunity as he screamed out and shot lightning into the Jedi Master of the Order. Mace was in shock, but he couldn't react as he no longer had his lightsaber and he was currently being shocked to death by Sidious before being thrown from the window. Mace flew out into the city, unconscious. He was flickering in and out of consciousness as he found himself falling to the ground. Just like he had in the Genosis Arena, he used the force to cushion his fall as he tumbled down into some trash cans and slammed his head against the wall. Windu was out cold. As the night cascaded away, something terrible happened. The night was cold, but eventually Mace woke up. He realized he was lost. He looked around as he found a bunch of homeless people around him. Mace looked at them as they all gasped, asking how he survived. Mace was confused. Being electrocuted and smacked in the head tends to leave one confused after all. Mace looked at the homeless people as he said he just used a force to survive his fall. The homeless people looked at one another. They didn't know what he meant by falling or surviving a fall. One of the homeless people spoke up. She said, not a fall. They were talking about the Jedi Temple. Mace's face steadied as the words processed into his mind. He asked what she meant as she walked over to an open way through the city. Mace followed her and then looked over as he saw the Jedi Temple bellowing in smoke. Mace's heart fell, as if it had been patient or if he waited for Master Yoda, this could have all been prevented. Mace fell to his knees. He failed the order he was meant to protect. He asked what happened. The homeless people spoke up, each of them hearing something different from someone else. But the general conclusion is that the clone army marched into the Jedi Temple. It wasn't widely known what the Jedi had done. Nobody knew, but they did know that the capital city was on high alert. Clone troopers seemed to be acting a little differently. Mace didn't know what they meant, but they said that the clones went from being human beings to droids that can think. Mace stood up. He needed to get to the Jedi Temple immediately, but first he needed his weapon. It could be anywhere. It was like finding a kyber crystal in the kyber mine. Mace had a connection with this crystal though, as he focused on the force and let it surround him. He felt it. It was just around the corner, thankfully. Mace thanked the homeless people before running towards the kyber crystal that was inside of his lightsaber. Once Mace rounded the corner, he saw a man holding the lightsaber. He used the force and pulled it towards him. The man turned and saw Mace and then ran. The Jedi Master of the Order needed to get to the Jedi Temple. There was no way he couldn't get there any later. Mace found a speeder shop and bought a small speeder before taking off towards the temple. Within the span of an hour, he arrived to the steps of the Jedi Temple. Mace saw a young Jedi walking up these steps as he asked the child to stop. She turned around and looked at Master Windu. She said she was scared. Windu asked who she was. Her name was Daisha Numa. She was a Jedi youngling. She was with her class and then she was separated when the temple went to high alert. She said she got outside of the temple and hid while there was a sound of gunfire screaming and bombings. She said she watched the smoke bellow out of the temple for hours until she eventually fell asleep. Mace asked why she was returning. She said that the message had been put out by Master Skywalker, telling all Jedi that the war was over and it was time for peace to begin. It was a message that was told to all Jedi to return to the Jedi Temple. Mace bit his lip as he told the young Twi'lek to stick close behind him. They walked up the steps of the Jedi Temple and found a bunch of Jedi. There were several people on the front steps wearing Jedi robes, and Mace thought it to be suspicious as he looked closely. The Jedi then all raised their blasters and began firing. Mace yelled out, telling Daisha to run for cover as she ignited her emerald lightsaber. Mace ignited his amethyst blade as he used his one good hand to defend himself. He was trying to defend Daisha too, but there were too many clones everywhere. Mace used the force to throw many from their feet, but when Mace turned around, he watched the young Jedi youngling fall to the ground. The clones surrounded her and then gunned her down. Mace knew that this would have been the fate regardless of him being here. He then turned around and cut down the clones before realizing their armor was blue. It was Skywalker's division. The question for Windu was, where was Skywalker? He could be anywhere. He could be here, and he could be here and now. As Mace finished off the clones on the front steps, he ran over to see if Daisha was alright. But she wasn't. She was dead. Mace closed her eyes as he stood up and walked into the temple. The sight was horrific. 
All the students, teachers, knights, and guards, they were all dead. Around their bodies were clone troopers. Mace kept walking through the temple. Burn marks from blasters scoured the interior. Mace turned around as he saw a couple of dead bodies on the ground. They were younglings. They were cut down by a lightsaber, and Mace's heart broke. He could never imagine that the events of the previous night would ever lead to this. Mace turned around when he heard footsteps and ignited his lightsaber, as he screamed out demanding to know who it was. Mace saw a little shadow dart across the hall. Mace called out, telling them that he was the master of the order. He was here to help. The shadow looked around the corner as Mace realized it was another Jedi youngling. She was scared to death from the movement. But also, the movement, she was very clearly wounded. Mace walked over and came to realize it was a youngling who had been stabbed by a lightsaber. Mace knelt down and asked if she was okay, but there wasn't a single word that came out of her mouth. She fell into Mace's arms and started sobbing. She asked why no one was here. She asked why no one protected them. Mace apologized. The heart inside of his chest fell into a million pieces. He couldn't imagine the pain she was in. So much pain and probably even anger that was keeping her alive. Mace asked what happened to her. She said that Anakin Skywalker came in. After her teacher was killed, they ran away. She told Mace that she thought he'd come to rescue them. And then he tore through them. He cut each child down, slowly as his men walked behind him without caring. Reva explained in excruciating detail what happened to her friends. Mace still was trying to wrap his mind around what Anakin had done, but even he couldn't believe what had happened. He didn't want to believe it. Mace didn't like Anakin to begin with. He never wanted him to be trained, and let alone led into the Order, but he could have never foreseen so much hate and pain to come from the boy. He couldn't ever imagine Anakin doing this or being this capable of this much pain and turning against the light in the way he did. Mace looked down at every body he passed, slain with blasters or cut down by a lightsaber. Many of them were students he knew, faces he'd come to know, and individuals with identities that were just being forged. Mace thought of all the faces he didn't see, all the names he couldn't find, submerged in a sea of dead bodies littered across the Jedi Temple's floors. Mace carried Reva to the medical facility and then Mace's eyes filled with tears as he turned the corner. It was obvious that there were Jedi trying to escape the medical facility. Jedi onto other Jedi, fallen on top of them dead. It looked like knights were carrying younglings to the medical facility and were shot down. Temple guards were littered around the area as it seemed as if they were trying to protect the injured. Mace turned into the room and saw dead bodies across the medical facility. Clone troopers dead at the doorway. But there were Jedi killed on the medical tables. Some didn't even get that far. Mace found an empty bed and placed Reva down. He asked her if there was anyone else alive. Reva was almost mute at this point. She didn't have anything to say. Mace just assumed that she was going through with this tough mental process by not speaking. Mace grabbed some supplies and turned around as he went to help her mend her wound. Reva looked over as tears streamed down her face. She asked Mace where Master Kenobi was. Then she asked where he was. Mace looked at the wall, and then down at his own arm, still missing. Mace placed the supplies down as he told her that the Jedi were deceived by a lie. Reva's tears melted down her face. She, she just couldn't believe it. She couldn't understand it. She just wanted to know. Everyone she knew and loved were executed, and, and she just wanted to know why no one could save them. She tried to raise her voice as Mace told her to save her strength. Windu looked around and as he told her that the Jedi were ordered to go across the galaxy. Mace was heading to the Senate to remove the Chancellor from power when Skywalker turned on him. Reva looked angry, as she could be. Mace understood. She had no reason to forgive him or any other Jedi. Mace told Reva that he was truly sorry. He was the master of the Order, and he wasn't there to protect them. It was his job, especially with Yoda being gone. Mace told Reva that he would give her some medication and that would help her, but it would knock her out for a couple of hours. During that time, he would search for other Jedi around the temple. He then promised that he would be back and he wouldn't leave her again. Reva grinded her teeth and then slowly fell asleep. Mace sighed as he walked back into the medical room and out of it and found a ligament. It was a right forearm. It was perfectly sized for his stature. All the medical droids were destroyed in the chaos, so he'd have to place this onto his arm, his health. Mace then found himself some materials and got to work. 
He did so over the course of the next hour or so and then moved out into the hallway. He heard talking, voices. Mace got low as he crept forward. He was going to kill them if they were clone troopers. When he peeked over, he saw a couple of younglings. There was just two of them. One of them was the widely known Wookiee youngling, Gungi, and the other one was a Jedi youngling from the same class and the tall and youngling named Zat. Windu spoke up as he looked down. The children almost jumped out of their skin. They looked up as Windu told them to come up. It was safe now. The two would eventually make their way up to Windu's position. Mace asked them what had happened to them. Zat and Gungi told Windu that the night was dark. They were leaving the Jedi archives when they heard a roaring. They finished early and they were able to go and enjoy the rest of the night. Biff and Ganuli were there and they were talking about sparring with one another while the rest of the group was going to head to the garden. Petro heard the noise and encouraged everyone to go check it out. Though when they got to the sound of the noise, they only sealed their own fate. When they rounded the corner into the great hall of the Jedi Temple, they saw terror. They, there were younglings crying and screaming, trying to get away, and they were just being shot down as they ran. The knights were surrounded and being picked off by dozens of clone troopers. The 501st marched into the temple and through the temple, and they did not stop. There was no sign of mercy. Zat told Windu that the group of temple guards came running around the corner and ran into battle. One of the temple guards stopped and looked into the chaos. He looked at the younglings and then took off his helmet. He was a young Paun man, and then he ran away. Petra then told the group that they couldn't be afraid like that temple guard. Though the second he said that, the clones surrounded them. Petra was the first one to be killed when the clones loaded him full of blaster bolts. Gungi recalled Katuni crying out before she too was shot dead. The rest of the class ignited their lightsabers as they defended themselves, but there was nothing they could do. The clones kept coming, and they couldn't be stopped. Zat recalled the clones shooting down every single member of their class. Gungi and Zat defended one another until Jocasta knew saved their lives. She told them to run and not look back. And so, that's exactly what they did. They ran into the night and hid outside the Jedi Temple. The smoke was seen into the day, and the two got the same message, that the war was over and that they could return, and that peace had just begun. The two were skeptical, but the orders came from Master Skywalker. Mace asked if they saw Skywalker during Order 66, and they didn't. They assumed he had saved the Jedi. They came in looking for him. Zat asked what happened to Master Skywalker. Windu told the two of them that he was no longer a Jedi. He had betrayed the Order. Both Padawans didn't know how to feel about this. It was news to them, and they didn't know how to process it. Windu told the two of them to stay put for the time being. Windu would go and investigate what he could and see if he could get a lead back on where Skywalker was, or where Sidious was. Windu would spend hours searching until he remembered to turn off the all clear sign. Even though it could bring more Jedi back, more Jedi that could be saved or trained, he didn't want anyone to see what had happened here. He didn't want anyone to hurt themselves trying to get back here. It would be safer for the Jedi to go back into hiding. Windu continued searching around and watched several hollow readings of the previous night. Windu went back to the council chambers for a moment and he didn't expect to find anything, but what he found was truly horrific. There were dozens of younglings slaughtered. Not a single one of them had a weapon, not a single one of them could go anywhere. Windu fell to his knees and let out a terrible scream. The limbs of younglings were scattered across the floors and their bodies several hours dormant. Windu thought of anything he could have done. There had to be something. He couldn't wrap his mind around any of it. Windu eventually made his way down to the center of the Jedi Temple where he found two more individuals. The relief for the discovery couldn't be put into words. Windu looked at the two other council members alive, Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and Grand Master Yoda. Windu was so relieved that there were others still alive, especially others of the council. It seemed as if the order was lost. Though both Kenobi and Yoda noticed that Windu was missing his dominant arm, replaced with a metallic shell. Obi-Wan and Yoda asked what had happened to Mace, considering that it was impossible that any clone could just cut off his arm. Windu would explain the entire series of events of the previous night, starting with Anakin's notion that Palpatine was a Sith Lord. Obi-Wan was already interested. He hadn't heard what had happened to his apprentice, and he feared for the worst. Maybe Mace had some insight into what had become of Obi-Wan's former student. Mace continued telling of the deaths of Stacey Tin, Agen Kalor, and Kit Fisto at the hands of Sidious. Then, when everything was right, in the right moment, Anakin cut off his forearm and joined the Sith. 
Obi-Wan was emotionless in this reaction. The words passed through his mind, but they didn't connect. He couldn't understand how Anakin could just do something like that. It didn't make any sense. Obi-Wan looked down at Master Yoda, who stood silently and shook his head in disapproval. He wasn't disappointed in Obi-Wan. Rather, he was saddened that Anakin had fallen as such, but he knew he did. Yoda watched Anakin grow, just as he did with Dooku, and just as Dooku left, so did Anakin. Yoda had a lot of weight in his heart, a lot of fear in his mind. He wished he never left for Kashyyyk or that Jedi Master Kiare Mundi never asked about the droid attack on the Wookiees. Yoda looked up towards Obi-Wan as he stood silent. Obi-Wan then tried to skew around the resolve as he asked Mace what happened next. Windu told Kenobi that he woke up in the morning. The temple was in shambles when he got here, and the clones of the 501st were stood outside dressed as Jedi, ready to execute anyone they saw. Which sadly, they claimed the lives of a few younglings before and once he got here. Obi-Wan asked and then he realized when Mace explained the unfortunate death of Daisha Numa. May said that the few younglings left survived by staying away from the temple or by playing dead. It was a massacre, and there was absolute death inside of the Jedi Temple. There was nothing the Jedi could do but stand up to the challenge. They needed to fight back and take that same fight to the Sith. Mace told the two that he had changed the communication device that told all Jedi to return to the temple. He had changed it a little after Yoda and Obi-Wan saw the code sent across the galaxy. He told all the Jedi to go in hiding. The time to return was not now. There were other Jedi Masters out in the galaxy, but there was no one saying how many were left. Yoda looked around at the ground as Mace begged the question, asking what happened to each of them. Obi-Wan told Mace that he had just beat General Grievous and took a wide sweep on the battlefield before getting to Commander Cody. The good clone commander gave Obi-Wan his lightsaber, and then moments later one of the heavy tanks shot a shell at him. Obi-Wan then explained that he was left to fall into the ground left to die. He told Windu that some of the clones assumed he had died, but even some were skeptical. Regardless, he was able to escape with Grievous' starship and meet up with Bail Organa and Master Yoda. Windu looked down at Master Yoda as he asked what the case was for him. Yoda expressed that his commander tried to execute him, and he sensed the change in the Force. As Master Luminara, he didn't see her. He hoped that she was able to escape, but the other Jedi on Kashyyyk were not accounted for. Yoda was thankful for Tarful and Chewbacca for getting him to safety, though sadly the Wookiees had a new war to fight. They had to fight off those who were trying to defend them. The clones didn't just turn on the Jedi, but they turned on the Wookiees as well. Not like the Wookiees were fond of seeing the Jedi become targets, one of their own was a Jedi after all. Yoda then asked how many were left inside the temple alive. Mace accounted for three out of 10,000. That's all he'd seen since his return. Yoda asked about Grogu, and Mace had no knowledge. His protectors were killed, but there was no sign of Grogu being inside the temple. Obi-Wan expressed that hopefully someone had taken him that wasn't Sidious. Obi-Wan then asked what the next move was. Yoda then said that the next move was destroying the Sith. They needed to. Obi-Wan then asked where the younglings should be moved to. Surely they couldn't stay inside the Jedi Temple, not with clones moving around and being as violent as they clearly were. Yoda told Obi-Wan that they were going to be sent off to a cave on the far side of the galaxy. It was a cave that Jocasta knew and a handful of council members knew about, so that in the case of an emergency, the most important documents the Jedi Order had could be moved there and kept safe. Yoda looked at Mace and asked where they were as they turned around and led them towards the children. Obi-Wan asked what their next move was. Mace said he would go and find Anakin, while he and Master Yoda would finish off Palpatine. Obi-Wan spoke. He said he wouldn't be able to kill Anakin. It was like a brother to Kenobi. He didn't believe he could do what he'd done. Mace turned around and placed his metallic hand on Obi-Wan's shoulder. He then pointed across the temple. He said that Anakin was dead. He was no longer there. What remained was an angry beast that would tear down everything Obi-Wan ever knew for his selfish desire. Anakin did this. He did the damage here. He was no longer the boy he trained, no longer the boy Qui-Gon wanted to train. Mace then firmly said Anakin is now an enemy to the Jedi and to their way of life. And, even more than that, the Republic. He must be stopped if the Jedi Order is to be survived. Obi-Wan bit his lip. He understood, but his heart broke. He frowned a little under his beard as he looked at Master Yoda and then at Mace. The three got to the medical wing as they turned the corner to see the three kids. They were talking. Reva looked over and saw Obi-Wan. 
Anger boiled up inside of her. She yelled out at him, demanding to know why he wasn't there to save them. She was so upset with Obi-Wan, because if anyone should have been there, it should have been him. Obi-Wan trained Anakin, and trained him to walk into the temple and disembody it. Reva shoved the other two out of her way as she walked up to Obi-Wan, demanding to know. She just wanted to know why he couldn't save them, why he couldn't stop Anakin. She got right up to him and looked into his blue eyes. Reva's eyes welted with tears as she tried to hold them back as she tried to stand strong in this moment of adversity. She knew what Mace told her, but she was still so angry. She was so upset that her family had died and she was only alive because of her anger. Obi-Wan looked down at her as he swallowed his tongue. He couldn't speak, as his lips quivered and his skin crawled beneath his robes. He was Obi-Wan Kenobi, poster boy of the Republic, teacher of Anakin Skywalker, and with all that, a failure. In the eyes of Reva, he failed them, and it broke his heart to see what Anakin had done to her. He knew it wasn't his fault, and even Reva did. But he was the closest thing to blame. He was the easiest thing to blame. She could blame him, and it would just be easier to blame him. Obi-Wan felt a tear fall out of his eye as Reva continued yelling until she fell to her knees, sobbing her eyes out. She looked down to the ground as her eyes made their way to her face, and the unstable emotional outburst crawled into her hands. Tears, fear, anger, pain, and everything in between as she let her eyes swallow the shame she felt. She cried out, asking why she wasn't strong enough to protect her friends, her family. Obi-Wan's eyes melted. He stepped down to his knees and got down to Reva's level. He placed his hand gently on her back and apologized. Reva looked up as her eyes met Obi-Wan's tears and continued to pour down as she looked away in shame. Obi-Wan told her that it wasn't her fault. It wasn't her sin to carry. Reva bit her lip as she heard the words come from Obi-Wan's mouth. Obi-Wan stuttered between words as he held himself together, trying to be a rock for someone that just lost a mountain. Reva looked at Obi-Wan, asking why Anakin would do this, why he would hurt everyone so bad. How could he? Obi-Wan looked down as a deep breath fell from his lungs. Obi-Wan didn't have the words to say. All he could say, with a calm resolve, is that now the most important thing to do was to be strong. Reva didn't need to save the ones lost. She survived. Much like everyone here, she survived. It wouldn't be easy to move on. It wouldn't be easy to forget what happened. But as close as the past was, it was done. It couldn't be changed. What could be changed was the present, and that change could affect the future. Reva's survivor guilt crawled down her spine, but the words Obi-Wan gave her were compassionate, true, and the real speaking of a true Jedi Master. Reva fell into Obi-Wan's arms as he told her that everything would be okay. Obi-Wan told her that the wrongs would be made right and that the Jedi could move on from what had been done. She weakly asked if he would kill Anakin. Obi-Wan sighed. The word sat at the tip of his tongue, but he couldn't get it out. He understood what this meant. He knew that now he needed to kill his best friend, his brother. He needed to kill Anakin Skywalker with no way of finding him. Obi-Wan looked down as he felt the pain in his heart and the sadness in his mind. He told Reva that he would. He would do it. He would be strong enough so that she didn't have to and so that she may be able to rest easy at night. Reva told Obi-Wan that she would never sleep the same way she did before her friends all died, right before her. Obi-Wan looked up as his gaze met the saddened eyes of Master Yoda and the befuddled eyes of Master Windu. It was hard to hear a child talk about this event. It was impossible to understand the implications of what it would do to her, and they couldn't do anything but listen. It was all of their failures. They all failed Reva, her class, her friends, the Jedi, the entire order. Mace told everyone that it was time to go. The children didn't know where they were going, and neither did Obi-Wan. The six made their way to the hangar bay as they found an operational shuttle and set the coordinates for Jakas' new secret location. They told them that once they beat the Sith, they would return to get them, and to save them. Each master told the children to have the Force be with them, and before they all exited the ship, and watched Reva, Dungi, and Zat depart for deep space. The three Jedi Masters turned around and walked through the wreckage, discussing their plan of action. It was obvious who was facing who. The real question was how Obi-Wan would find Anakin. Yoda told Obi-Wan to trust his feelings, and he would find Skywalker. Mace was very tempted to join Obi-Wan, but he knew that Obi-Wan knew how to beat Anakin. Mace needed to be with Yoda, 
so that they could kill Sidious together. Mace had done it before, before Anakin arrived that is, so he'd be able to do it again. The three bowed to one another and wished the best for one another on their journey. Yoda and Mace went to the Senate building as Yoda explained everything he knew regarding the special session of Congress. Obi-Wan on the other hand went to Padme's apartment. Obi-Wan was prescient on knowing the location of his student. Padme didn't tell him anything, cause she ain't no snitch. Obi-Wan turned around and then looked across the cityscape. Obi-Wan thought hard and long. Padme could be seen sitting on the couch, pregnant as ever, as if she would burst. Obi-Wan told Padme while facing the Jedi Temple across the city that Anakin had done something terrible. Padme's concern rose. Obi-Wan turned around and looked into Padme's eyes as he told her that he murdered everyone inside of the temple. He attempted to kill Windu, and he traumatized the three surviving members of youngling classes. Padme looked in disbelief. Obi-Wan told her that one of those survivors was stabbed by him. She looked into Anakin's eyes as he pushed his blade through her stomach, attempting to kill her. Obi-Wan bit his lip and then spoke up, and louder than he ever had in front of Padme. He told her that Anakin did more than just kill. He ruined her. He broke her to the core, and all she could do is be helpless and pretend to be dead. Obi-Wan said to Padme, as a tear rolled down his face, he told Padme that he was begging her. Anakin was more than just a great threat. He had the potential to ruin something he helped create. Obi-Wan gestured forward as Padme felt the insatiable shame. She looked at Obi-Wan and then away. Obi-Wan cleared his face as he pleaded that Padme tell him where Anakin was. Padme told Obi-Wan she wouldn't tell him. Obi-Wan sighed as he lifted his robe above his head and turned around. Padme told Obi-Wan that she would take him to Anakin. If what he said was true, then Anakin had truly become a great threat and was in no position to be a father. Padme's saddened eyes filled her with shame as she told Obi-Wan that they would leave in the coming hours. She just needed to get ready. Obi-Wan nodded as he sat down on the couch and looked at a small trinket on the table. It was a Chapur snippet. It was crafted by someone, and while Obi-Wan held it, little did he realize it was the first gift Anakin ever gave to his future wife. He built it for her as a boy and gave it to her. Obi-Wan placed it down gently as he felt his head. He was in so much emotion of turmoil. Eventually, Obi-Wan and Padme left Coruscant for Mustafar. At the same time, Lord Sidious was in contact with his apprentice. He told Lord Vader that he felt a disturbance. Vader was very concerned about his new master, and so he asked what it was. Sidious didn't know, but as he heard the voice of Mace Windu, Anakin knew what he had to do. He needed to get back to Coruscant immediately, as he ran from the room and got to his Jedi Starfighter and took off. At the same time, Mace Windu and Yoda stood in the small office as they both looked at Sidious. The hooded man with eyes of yellow that had deceived them for 13 years sat quietly as he grinned. Though part of Sidious was fearful, he had lost to Windu only the previous night. Sidious didn't know if he could beat both Windu and Master Yoda in a simultaneous duel. Sidious was hoping he could time everything correctly, and maybe if he held on long enough, Vader would be able to get there and save him. But Mustafar was on the other side of the galaxy. The chances of Vader getting there soon enough was rather unlikely. Sidious looked at the two Jedi. He had to play this smart as he possibly could. He couldn't throw away his advantage like he did with the other Jedi Masters when he threw himself into the middle of the room and killed all three of them. He could move like a cyclone, but so could Windu, and surely Yoda could too. He'd been the Grand Master for so long it was unreasonable to believe he wasn't powerful. Sidious lunged into the middle of the room as he jabbed forward at Windu, igniting his lightsaber. The Master of the Order was still getting used to his new arm, and he was able to block against his aggressive opponent. Mace bounced back as Yoda threw himself forward. He noticed that Mace was certainly off balance. Sidious noticed as he swung his blade around and met with Yoda's emerald blade. Sidious then pushed his advantage on Yoda as he swung violently forward. Sidious then moved back as he blocked Windu's advance. Yoda and Windu got side by side as they jumped into attack position. They tried their best to throw Sidious off balance. Yoda jumped back and forth as Palpatine mimicked the movement. Windu knew this aggressive form from Yoda and from Sidious when sparring with the Grand Master and dueling Sidious the previous night. Windu spun back around as he backed off. Green and red lit the room up as Sidious and Yoda bounced off the furniture against one another. Their power was unmatched as they moved into almost complete unison. Sidious was incredible, and so was Yoda. Windu saw this before, and he knew he could beat it. It would take time, but he knew it certainly was possible for him to beat this one. 
Windu threw himself into combat as Sidious shot lightning at the Jedi Master. Windu groaned as his metallic arm shot shockwaves of power into Mace's skin. Mace threw his metallic arm from his body, as he used his non-dominant arm to fight with. His blade was poised for action. Sidious's rage bellowed as he swung forward and backed up. There was no escape out of this room, and there was only one way out, which was up. Which the pod was too small for the three duelists. There was no way that Sidious, even with Mace's bad arm, could win on that small platform. Sidious then toyed as he moved back and forth and faked forward and jabbed, and then he pulled back around as he met Blaze with Yoda. Their duel was legendary. Sidious used all of his best moves against Yoda and Windu as he moved around like a tornado, using the best of his abilities whichever way he could to achieve a victory. Yoda saw that Sidious was doing what he could to win as he jumped at the Sith Lord, pushing him off balance. Sidious stumbled back as he found a proper target as he jabbed his blade forward, slicing into Mace Windu's ribs. The mass of the Order tumbled to the ground as he regained his composure. He had been put through the ringer as he fell behind Yoda. Sidious cackled as he blocked a swing by Yoda. He then fell back as he saw Yoda try and seize the opportunity from him. Yoda threw Sidious from his feet into a similar fashion as how Windu did the previous night. But without mercy, Yoda cut through Sidious' throat, extinguishing the Sith Lord forever. Yoda looked back at Windu, who was huddled over, holding onto his ribs as he caught his breath. He felt agonizing pain as he breathed in heavily, struggling to catch his breath, realizing that he had half of his lungs to breathe with. Yuendu looked at Yoda as the two of them realized that they had just killed the Sith Lord. It was now up to Obi-Wan to finish the job of killing and extinguishing the Sith. On Mustafar, the ship landed. Padme was ready to kill her husband. She wore a robe and held a tight blade underneath that same robe as she stumbled down the ramp. Obi-Wan told her to stay secured as he would go look for Anakin. Obi-Wan carried himself properly. He was going to win this for everyone that suffered inside of the Jedi Temple during Operation Nightfall. Obi-Wan realized what pain was warranted by Anakin's insane behavior. Obi-Wan picked up pace as he ran through the doors into the complex. Kenobi looked back and forth as he kept following the trace of corridors. He followed the path as he entered a room and then covered his mouth once more. He couldn't believe it. Again, Anakin had done the unthinkable. The Separatist leaders were scoured across the room, like they were nothing. Obi-Wan didn't like them, sure. They started a war, but this fate was not something that he would have wanted them to have. It was too far. He tried to see if there's any survivors. He heard a welting breath from the far room. Obi-Wan ran over, and it was a gruesome leader of the Techno Union, Wat Tambor. The grimy man laid on the ground, choking on air. There was nothing he could do to escape the death that was coming for him. Obi-Wan asked Tambor what happened to him. The weak man spoke up as he told Kenobi that Sidious promised them sanctuary here. He promised that they would be taken care of by Lord Vader, and then the doors began to close. There was no escape. Watt heard everyone die. He heard Gunray try and plead with him before he yelped in pain as he was cut down. Tambor described the scenario almost in the same way that Reva described it inside the temple. It was painful for Obi-Wan to hear, but he needed to hear it. He needed to know what Anakin had done, because Anakin was no longer him anymore. He was now Vader. Obi-Wan apologized to Watt as the man died on the cold floor of the industrial complex. Obi-Wan stood up as he looked around, hoping to know if Anakin was still around. But then he got a comlink call. It was Padme. She told Obi-Wan that she needed to get to a medical facility immediately. Anakin wasn't here, but they needed to go. Obi-Wan figured what that meant as he turned the corner and ran out of the Mustafar industrial complex. He saw Padme and C-3PO walking up the ramp slowly. It could only mean one thing, Earth. Obi-Wan knew of a local medical facility that would help with all their needs. It was important that they got there and took care of Padme's pregnancy. Outside of Coruscant, a ship exited hyperspace and made its way down towards the Senate chambers. Anakin landed and was greeted by dozens of Coruscant guardsmen. They all saluted him as he told them to follow him. They all got in line behind him as Commander Fox stood right behind Skywalker, marching in unison. The group marched through the Senate building as Anakin's robes floated behind him. His yellow glare could be seen from miles away. Anakin demanded that Fox tell him where his master was. Fox said that the Emperor was in his office under the Senate chambers. Anakin and the group made their way there, immediately. Mace looked to Yoda as his demeanor changed. Vader was here. His essence was much more powerful than it was before, and it even startled Mace a little. Yoda, on the other hand, would not stand for this any longer, both Jedi Masters assuming that Obi-Wan had been killed by Vader. 
Mace and Yoda realized and ready themselves, as the sound of marching could be heard from down the corridor. Mace placed the mechanical arm back onto his body as he prepared himself alongside of Master Yoda. The two Jedi realized that they stood before the opportunity to stop Vader and the legacy of the Sith. Vader walked up to the door as he grinned. He saw how fragile Mace was and how tired Yoda was. This simply would be easy as it was to destroy the Jedi Temple with the 501st. Part of Anakin had a fear of Yoda, though the rest of them was ready for any challenge that he was ready to face. He wasn't just a Jedi anymore, he was a Sith. He was Lord Vader. Vader then looked over and saw Palpatine slain. Before he could say anything to Commander Fox, he told his men to span out and prepare a firing line. Vader knew he needed to strike before his reinforcements were slaughtered by the Jedi. Yoda told Anakin that he was a disappointment to the Order before igniting his lightsaber once more. Windu ignited his lightsaber as he told Skywalker that the rank of master was almost his, but it would never belong to him after what he did. He was going to learn the consequences of falling to the Sith side, to the dark side of the force. The master thing moved Anakin a little bit, and then Vader looked back as he ignited his lightsaber and lunged across the room. The clones continued moving out as they got their guns ready. Commander Fox didn't expect Anakin to get so rowdy as the clones tried to pick their target. Though at this point, there were three lightsabers dancing around the room. The clones picked their targets as they opened fire against the sound of clashing lightsabers. Vader slid under a strike by Windu as he pushed the Master of the Order to the side. The clones lit Windu up and pumped him full of blaster fire. Anakin grinned and cut through Master Windu as he turned around and collided blades with Master Yoda. Yoda couldn't believe it. He watched Windu fall to the ground lifelessly. Yoda leaped as he swung at Vader and then blocked an array of blaster fire. Vader was ruthless as he swung violently. He didn't hold back. He was the most powerful being in the galaxy, according to himself, and nothing would stand in his way. Yoda and him lodged their blades against one another as Anakin jumped, avoiding a swing from Yoda, as Yoda turned around and used the force to throw every single clone against the wall, knocking them all out. Yoda leaped back as Anakin swung at him. Vader got aggressive as he saw the opportunity. Yoda was then able to turn the tide on Anakin around as he began throwing swings and strikes at Anakin as fast as he could. He used all of his power to throw Vader back and it began to work as Vader got on defense and fell back into the corridor. Yoda and Vader began to fight back and forth, slashing through the wall and cutting down lights around them. Vader swung forward and then stepped back as he defended himself from the onslaught. Yoda leaped aggressively using the tight corridor to get more movement from within himself. Vader stepped back and then swung forward yet again. He caught Yoda off balance as Yoda rolled to the ground and then flipped back up. Vader saw his opportunity as his dark robes covered him in this duel for his life. The sounds of blades clashing got the attention of more troopers as they moved to the location. Yoda pushed Vader out of the corridor as he began to stand his ground. Vader and Yoda moved around as cyclone of speed, torrents of power. Their power was legendary as their blades echoed across back and forth as they clashed with one another. Clones on either side of the surrounding area came and watched the duelists, all raising their blasters. Drawing Yoda's attention from Skywalker as he slammed Yoda back and then used the force to lift him up into the air. Vader threw Yoda down to the ground as hard as he could, slamming Yoda down. Yoda tried to do anything as Vader jabbed to the ground to watch Yoda squirm away. Vader stood up and looked at the clones and then back down at Yoda while pulling Grandmaster Yoda's blade away with the force. With a simple nod, the clones executed Master Yoda, who was being held in place by Vader. Vader looked at the clones, and then told them to clean up the mess and ensure the Jedi were dead. As Vader walked away, blaster fire could be heard. The clones began pumping both Jedi full of laser bolts. Vader continued walking out of the Senate building. His next responsibility was his family. The one that was supposed to be on the other side of the city, not the galaxy. At the same time, Obi-Wan carried Padme inside the facilities at Polis Maso. The droids were able to get to her and take care of her as she gave a healthy birth. Kenobi helped the droids and then, after the twins were born, Luke and Leia, Obi-Wan began to meditate. He knew Anakin would be here soon, but he didn't know when that would be. Obi-Wan knew he had to get the children and Padme away from here before his former apprentice ripped the galaxy apart. Anakin arrived in the apartment as he felt rage bellow through his body. Padme was gone. She wasn't on the planet, and her ship was missing. Anakin raged and raged until he remembered the tracker he had implanted in C-3PO during the Clone Wars. He put it there in case of emergencies. 
there was a good chance that he was with Padme. He never wasn't. When Anakin found the tracker, he saw that C-3PO was on Polis Massa. Without hesitating, Anakin moved as quickly as he could to get to that planet. Hours passed by. Obi-Wan waited until Padme was ready and got enough rest. As Obi-Wan awoke from his meditation, he saw a yellow starfighter land on the facility, landing platform. Obi-Wan would leap to his feet as he would run down the hallway below him. Padme was still very clearly sleeping, and the twins were located next to her in little floating cots. Obi-Wan ran to the adjacent hallway as he locked eyes on the piercing yellow eyes of his former student. Obi-Wan spoke up, telling Anakin that it's time to stop. Vader stepped forward, igniting his lightsaber, telling Kenobi to step aside. There was no way he could stop him. Obi-Wan stepped back as he tried to figure out what that meant. It didn't matter because Anakin would spell it out for him. Anakin told Obi-Wan that Yoda and Mace were killed by him on Coruscant. There was no way that he could finish what they started. Obi-Wan looked at this animal that Anakin had become. He wasn't his student, this was not Anakin Skywalker. Vader demanded that Obi-Wan step aside so that he could see his wife. Obi-Wan told Vader that he would not be allowed to hurt them. Vader stepped forward as Padme stepped out from around the corner. Obi-Wan didn't notice as he held his position, defensive with his hand on his lightsaber, though not ignited. Padme told Anakin that everything he did was for nothing. Vader snapped out of focus on Obi-Wan and he asked Padme what she meant. She explained to him that she had a healthy birth. She was perfectly okay. He hurt so many people for literally nothing. Vader stuttered. He stepped back as both Padme and Obi-Wan watched his eyes flicker from yellow into blue. Vader struggled to stay present as he pushed his way back and then Anakin returned. It was seen as a reflection in a single tear falling down his face. Anakin saw Padme and Obi-Wan standing on the other side of the hallway. He couldn't believe it. He was looking at Padme with his own two eyes, and she was no longer pregnant. She gave birth, and the twins were alive, though Anakin didn't know they were twins. Obi-Wan looked at Padme as she nodded her head ashamed. Obi-Wan sighed. He couldn't believe she had turned back to Anakin's side after everything he had done, but Anakin cried out in a horrific no. He let go of his fear, and everything he had done rushed into his mind. He saw everything starting from the moment he cut off Windu's forearm. Anakin went through every memory slowly, as he felt every action committed. Anakin looked blankly as he watched the memories cascade into his mind and his heart broke. Anakin at heart was a good man, but what he did was unbelievable. The pain he caused was a genocide. He killed so many for no reason at all. Padme was fine, and the Sith lied to him. Anakin fell to his knees as he dropped his lightsaber from his hand. It rolled away from him as Obi-Wan stepped forward slowly, cautiously, watching the boy who became a man fall in part in front of him. Anakin watched younglings filled with hope watch as that hope deteriorated as Master Skywalker cut through each and every single one of them like they weren't living beings. Anakin placed his head in his hands as he cried aloud. Obi-Wan stepped forward. He was determined to kill Anakin, but this wasn't Vader. His heart broke watching Anakin sob like this. This was the boy who he trained, the child who he raised, his best friend, his brother. Obi-Wan stepped forward slowly as he inched closer. He watched Anakin's guilt trickle out, pain seeped from the black robes on the ground. Obi-Wan said Anakin's name as his apprentice looked at him with tears rolling down his face, showing and pain riding from away from his soul. Anakin bit his lip as he took a deep breath. He needed to say something, anything. He knew that Obi-Wan would feel the same burden he felt when Ahsoka left him. Anakin struggled for the words as he said his master's name, calling him Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan asked what it was as he ushered himself to Anakin's side. Obi-Wan grabbed a hold of Anakin's arm as he got down to Anakin's level. He looked into the eyes of his fallen apprentice. Anakin's lips showered in pain as he spoke out. He told Obi-Wan that he wasn't his failure. He told Obi-Wan that he didn't fail him. Obi-Wan shook his head. His throat swelled. His eyes felt heavy again. Anakin's sobs echoed through the corridor. Obi-Wan held his fallen apprentice and patted him on the back and told him that eventually one day, everything would be okay. Eventually, the rights would be wronged. Anakin cried out. He couldn't believe what he had done. Anakin told Obi-Wan that he was so sorry for everything. He apologized over and over again as he grabbed a hold of his master's arms. 
Obi-Wan stayed knelt and looked forward as he listened to every word come out of Anakin's mouth. Anakin apologized to the names, the people, the students, the teachers, everyone who he'd hurt. The galaxy was in pain because of what he did, and Obi-Wan listened as tears filled his eyes. He couldn't believe what Anakin had done as he held the boy who he trained in his arms. Obi-Wan looked at Anakin, both of their eyes filled with incurable pain. Obi-Wan patted Anakin on his shoulder as the two of them, as the two brothers, stared at one another. Anakin covered his eyes as more tears fell out of them. Obi-Wan pulled his lightsaber out and ignited it into Anakin's chest. Anakin silently gasped for air. As Obi-Wan watched, Anakin's face turn pale. Anakin looked at Obi-Wan with shock and with pain, not believing what had just happened, but understanding why it did. Obi-Wan placed his hand on Anakin's face, as he told him he would always love him and he was sorry that it ever had to come to this. Anakin placed a hand on Obi-Wan's hand, as a single tear fell down and landed on Obi-Wan's hand. Anakin tried to speak as he slowly fell into lifelessness. Obi-Wan watched Anakin mouth, thank you, before going dormant finally. Obi-Wan watched as Anakin's lifeless body fell to the ground. He didn't move, he just sat there silently. Anakin lay dead in his lap as he felt the weight of the galaxy fall off of his shoulders. Obi-Wan looked blankly forward, not knowing how he would ever come to what had just happened. Obi-Wan sighed with a blank stare as he felt the dead weight of the boy he raised fill his lap. Kenobi wiped away final tears as he closed Anakin's eyes and held Anakin's hand. Padme walked up behind Obi-Wan and placed her hand on his shoulder. Obi-Wan shook his head in disappointment. He never wanted it to come to this. No one did. Of course Padme didn't. She now had twins with no father. The galaxy was in shambles and the Clone Wars were over. The biggest players in the galaxy were all dead. The Separatist leaders, most of the Jedi Council, the Emperor, they were all dead. Obi-Wan waited until the medical droids picked up Anakin and placed his dead body in an incinerator. Obi-Wan apologized to Padme as the two of them hugged one another. When they first met 13 years before, they would have never assumed it would ever come to this. They had no clue what their future would hold for them, but they did know that it would be different than anything they would have ever assumed it would be in the last 48 hours. Obi-Wan and Padme would eventually take the twins off Polis Masa and to Naboo. Obi-Wan would gift Padme with the lightsaber of her husband. Padme would ask where Obi-Wan was going to go. As he told her that he would rebuild the Jedi Order, he would assume the role of Grand Master and unite the lost Jedi from across the stars. There were so many lost children that needed guidance. While it would take months to rekindle the lost order, and months for the Senate to reform and the Republic to be reinstated, it would eventually come. And when it came, it would see the galaxy finally uniting together. With a new Chancellor, the Republic would revoke Order 66. The Jedi would be allowed to exist, but they would stay in hiding. Though with Order 66 revoked, many clones would pay their respects to the Jedi that they murdered. Some clones would struggle with the aftermath, especially those who had surviving Jedi that they met. Obi-Wan would send a message out across the galaxy, telling the Jedi where to regroup, where they would rebuild their order. As for Luke and Leia, they would never be told about the terror that their father brought into the galaxy. Their mother and uncle Obi-Wan Kenobi would only ever tell them the story of the great Anakin Skywalker. While the Jedi could use them, they would never be permitted to join the Order, so that they may live the life that their father would have wanted them to have. Kenobi wouldn't teach them the ways of the Force, but he would alongside the rebuilding of this Order give the children the love and care that they needed from a fatherly figure. It would take centuries for the Fallen Order to rebuild, as it rebuilt the galaxy around it would find itself in peace. The citizens, even some of the most influential people, would find peace. The children of Skywalker would enjoy the stories of their father and love the bond with father and their uncle as the galaxy moved into an era of long-lasting peace. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to George Story, Benjamin Wells, Jay Hoffman, War Pigman, 308, Icy Raptor, Gort, and Chancellor Lawrence Sanders for supporting the channel. Let's get to like this video so we can see whatever the thumbnail is here. I haven't decided on the video yet. And if you want to see a what if, let me know down below or in the comments when to do crossovers. Check out the Twitch community, Discord, and Patreon if you want to support me in other ways. And if you want to learn how to win in our contest, subscribe because we're shooting for 50,000 subscribers. There's a pinned comment down below. You go down below. There's a doc. So you put your name in the doc. And I'll pick 
three winners when I hit 50,000 subscribers. We're almost there. Let's keep doing it. Also, special thanks to all of you for helping me reach 4.1 million views. I just realized that we hit 4 million views like today, and I'm extremely grateful, and I, I do this all for you guys, and couldn't have been done without you, so I greatly appreciate you for that. Um, let's talk about our story here. Uh, this one is, it's so sad. Oh my goodness. This one is, is tragic. Um, it was really sad. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, I, I promise you I'm, I'm okay. I'm not like, like, I'm not going to hurt myself, but like, this was like a really dark story. I don't know where it came from either, but I think, I think the truth is, is like, when you talk about order 66, I don't think I don't think Order 66 has been talked about in this light, right? And I think we romanticize Order 66 a bit too much. Obviously, it's it's always really interesting to watch the Jedi and the clones have that that final showdown, and and what we saw in the Kenobi show and and even Book of Boba Fett regarding Order 66 was was really incredible imagery. Um, but the truth is is that the imagery is reminiscent of something that happens in our own world, and. I think I kind of took that approach without meaning to, and I'm kind of coming across that that idea while talking about this now. Uh, so it's definitely going to be not put together as well as it could have been if I had thought about it before. But the the tragedy of the story is that it really goes in the depth. Like what what would go through these these people's minds? And I know Reva isn't exactly a fan favorite character, but she would have been there, so she's there. <laughs> uh, but. I mean, imagine her interacting with Obi-Wan. I mean, she's a kid. She's what, maybe maybe six, seven, ten years old at the oldest? She doesn't know how to process what just happened. Most adults don't know how to process what happened. I mean, that, that the, the damage of that, that Order 66 would have done to the younglings is intangible. I, I mean, it, it's awful. It's, it's truly tragic and very sad. And I, I don't think there's a way to tell this story without it being tragic. It, that's that that's the tragedy of it. it it's it's not a happy story and I mean mace coming back and, and saving the, the the people I mean the the two the three it, it's really nice but at the end of the day you know he doesn't get to save everyone and I think uh, it's, it's oh my goodness this is really a tragic story I mean it, it, this was a tragic story it's really kind of depressing uh, I'm sorry about that I really it, it just it's gonna hit some people differently and I'm sorry <laughs> I really am. I really... Every story is told with a lot of emotionality into it, and that's the, that's the point. Stories are meant to be emotional. Uh, they're supposed to make you feel something, and I hope I hope, I hope, hope it made you feel something, but eh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as for Daisha, I know some of you guys, that's a fan favorite to some of you guys. Um, I did her dirty. I love Daisha, but can't play favorites. I just can't. Uh, sad, but true. As for the end of the story, uh, I think that's going to get the most confusion, the confusion between Obi-Wan killing Anakin the way he did. I think after, I, 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 I kind of had the intention of doing that, and I had to set it up. I had to set it up. There's no way I couldn't set it up. And I needed to set it up by Obi-Wan having that interaction with Reva. Just needed to. Obi-Wan couldn't kill Anakin on Mustafar. He just couldn't. He left him to die, yes. But there was nothing stopping him from, like, spearing his lightsaber into... Anakin's face. He could have done that, and he could have ended the legacy of Vader. But Obi-Wan, and we see in the Kenobi show, and I don't get me started, because I knew you guys are going to start saying everything in the comment section. I don't want to hear it. But same thing in the Kenobi show. He cannot kill Anakin. I think having that moment with Reva, right after this happened, right after Order 66, where you just you see this innocent child just like have her entire world fall apart on her, the, the expression trying to give trying to be her rock when she lost a mountain he was trying to be her rock and she lost a mountain and i think that that right there captures why obi-wan would do what he did to anakin at the end of the story i know it's tragic i know it, it holding his his brother is the, the child he raised the child he trained and just being like you know what i he can't he can't exist he's not gonna be able to live with himself obi-wan knows that obi-wan knows anakin's not gonna be able to live with himself and he also knows that it it's just it, he can't let Anakin get away with it you know it he would have gotten away with it I mean technically according to Republic law he would have been obeying the law because the Jedi were technically illegal so you know he wouldn't be prosecuted or whatever uh, and the Jedi don't seek revenge so he had to do it you know it wasn't the Jedi way to kill him the way he did but 
he needed to. He needed to, to do it. And I hope you respect that artistic decision by me. I don't think Obi-Wan could have just let Anakin get away with that. Let him just go live a life and, and have two children that could do the same thing to the galaxy. And I think Obi-Wan would be completely afraid of, of, of having Luke and Leia learn the Force. But I think, I think he would be their father. I think he would, in turn, be their father. He would do what he was meant to do with the children before, in, in canon at least, and, you know, raise the children. I think he would have done that. I think he would have been that for what Anakin would have needed him to be for his children. So, I hope you all enjoyed the story. I know it's rather tragic, really tragic, but as is Order 66, I think, I think on a real note, you do have to address what I addressed, and that's the tragedy of it. You just have to address it. You can't ignore that it happened. Um, and ignore that it's something that does happen, but without talking politics, because it's not a poli politics channel, uh, Star Wars has always been influenced by modern events. That's just the truth. And Order 66 is no different. And that's the sad thing about it. But I think, I'll say this, I'm going to be blatant with this. I think, I think I was able to give a much different perspective of Order 66 than anyone's probably ever seen in this community in a video. I think I think in the Star Wars community, uh, modestly I can say, I believe I've given probably the most realistic approach to Order 66 in any what-if video uh, right here. And I hope I portrayed the story well enough, and I hope I did a good job with the story. And as always, my friends, I love you all. Spread the love. Be safe, everybody. And always remember, may the Force be with you. Thank <laughs> you.